Folks, here's our next example problem. We've got a three kilogram box and it's on an elevator that goes up from the first to the second floor. Um, this happens in three stages and you may need to convince yourself that this is gonna be true, uh, but I hope that you can see that it is. First, it asks to speed up from rest and we're gonna say the acceleration is two meters per second each second. From there, it will move up with a constant speed. We don't want it to continuously get faster and faster and faster. Uh, eventually, we'll just wanna coast and then at stage three, we want to slow down to a stop with an acceleration of two meters per second each second. And then you can get off once the elevator has slowed down to a stop. Here's gonna be our goals. And I may add in a third goal too, but here are our main goals. So write this down, pause the video. All right, and here are our goals in this problem. We want to draw a motion map and free body diagram for the whole trip. And we want to annotate which stage is which of those three stages. And then we want to determine the magnitude of the force that the floor exerts on the box at each stage. I may also want to draw the kinematics graphs. Um, not almost. I definitely want to draw the kinematics graphs as well. Um, so we'll do that probably in part A, position, velocity, and acceleration versus time graphs. So go ahead and pause the video, write this down, and let's go ahead and get started. All right, as always, we'll start with a sketch. Here is our elevator. Inside of that elevator is a box. And that box is going to be our system. So we're gonna enclose it in a dash circle. I'm going to not include the surface in that system. The surface will be external to the box system. All right, now that I've got that, let's draw a motion map. The motion map looks like this. It starts on the first floor at rest, and then it's moving up and getting faster. From there, so this is zone one, stage one. From there, it moves with a constant speed uh, yep, that's, that'll do. Maybe you want one more dot in there, but it'll be enough for us. I'm running out of room. Stage two. And then from there, it slows to a stop. Stage three. Uh, number zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Number my frames and draw my velocity arrows in. And we notice that they get bigger in the first four frames from zero to three. They remain the same length for the next two frames, and they get shorter again until we're at a rest. All right, um, so let's draw in velocity change arrows next. Here we're moving up, but getting faster. So the velocity change must be in the upward direction. Here we're maintaining a constant velocity, so the velocity change is zero, and here we are um, slowing down. So the velocity change must be opposite the direction that we're moving. So the velocity change is down. Uh, oh, it's gonna bother me if this is on the opposite side. Let's change that real quick. All right, our diagram looks better now. And remember this arrow here is where the physics is happening. Not the blue arrows, but the change arrows. Let's draw a body diagram for each of those three stages. Let's keep this going. All right. I'm gonna start with the middle, actually. When we're moving at a constant velocity, the forces are balanced. So the downward force that the Earth exerts on the box must be the same as the upward force that the floor exerts on the box. Those two are the same. Here, when we're getting faster, because the velocity change is upward, the floor must be pushing harder than the Earth is, because nothing else is interacting with this box, right? There's the floor down here, the Earth's pulling it down, but there's no other things touching this box. So these are the only two possible forces. And so that means, at this stage, 
the force that the floor exerts on the box must be larger than the force that the earth exerts on the box. This force is bigger than that force. Make sure your arrows show that. I might even try to make this a little bit smaller to really emphasize that. And then last but not least, here, the velocity change is downward, which means the net force must be downward. If the net force is downward, that means our downward forces are bigger than our upward forces. And so the, gra the force that the earth exerts on the box downwards must be bigger than the force that the floor exerts on the box. Because the net unbalance in the force must match up with the velocity change arrow direction because this is the same as the direction of the acceleration. All right. So those are our free body diagrams. Think to your elevator riding experience and maybe if you are feeling up to it and you have your parents' permission, maybe even go to a building that has an elevator um, and confirm this. We would do this in the classroom if we were in the classroom. Um, but, right, we've got, um, only with your parents' permission and I can't really endorse it because COVID, but uh, think back to your elevator experience. You're gonna feel heavier at this stage. And the feeling of heaviness comes from the floor pushing into you harder than it normally does. Up here, you are going to feel lighter. And that feeling of lightness is gonna come from the floor pushing into you less than it normally does. Um, the extreme examples of these are roller coasters, right? When you are, sometimes you feel the seat really pushing into you and you feel really heavy. And sometimes, maybe at the top of a hill, um, you almost fall, you almost lift out of your seat, right? Because the surface isn't pushing into you very hard. Uh, you may also notice this when driving uh, down a valley or on top of a hill while you're in your car um, to a lesser extent because you're not going as fast, but you might experience the same thing. And our goal is to now determine what the strength of this force is in each case. Let's go about doing that. First, we will want to compute the strength of the force that the Earth exerts on the box, which will be constant the whole time. As you move up and down in that gravitational field of the Earth, um, it's a constant field approximately near the surface, and so it's not changing. We've got the mass of the box times the gravitational field strength of the Earth, and that mass is, what, um, three kilograms, I believe I made it. And G here, I'm gonna call it 10, we're gonna use that approximation. But maybe 9.8 is better if you're doing something like mastering physics, but we'll do easy numbers. So we've got 30 is the number, let's check units. We've got kilograms, newtons per kilogram, we're left with newtons overall as our units, which is good because we're talking about the strength of the force that the Earth exerts on the box. And now, with that in mind, we're gonna figure out the strength of the force that the floor exerts on the box in each of our three scenarios. Scenario one, we are going to look here. The force is bigger than the gravitational force, and the acceleration is in the positive direction. I'm choosing my positive y direction to be upwards. And so writing Newton's second law, the acceleration in the y direction is going to be the sum of the forces in the y direction over the mass of the box. And the sum of the forces in this case is equal to the upward force that the floor exerts on the box minus the downward force that the earth exerts on the box. Maybe make that a little bit prettier. All right, rearranging this, solving for our unknown, right? We know the acceleration, the mass, and this force. This is our unknown, the others are known. Um, we're gonna make the force the floor exerts on the box the subject of this equation first by getting it by itself, and then we'll plug in numbers, which is the procedure you should always follow. We we'll multiply mass on each side, and we'll end up with the mass times the acceleration in the y direction is equal to the force that the floor exerts on the box 
minus the force that the earth exerts on the box. We add this term over to the other side of the equation uh, because again we're trying to get the force the floor exerts on the box by itself. Uh, we end up with the mass times the acceleration in the y direction is uh, plus the force that the earth exerts on the box is equal to uh, the force the floor exerts on the box, which is ultimately what we're trying to find. And now, known, 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 I can figure out what I'm looking for. So this force over here, I'm going to write it on the left now, the force that the floor exerts on the box is equal to mass times acceleration, uh, 3 kilograms, multiplied by positive 2 meters per second each second. I know it's positive because my velocity change is in the positive direction there. It's up in the positive direction. So this is a positive 2 meter per second per second acceleration. Add in the force that the Earth exerts of the box, which was 30 newtons. And overall, don't need a calculator, 3 times 2 is 6. 6 plus 30 is 36 newtons. So the force that the floor exerts on the box is equal to 36 newtons which is consistent with what we said, that the force in stage one should be greater than the force that the Earth exerts on the box. Stage two ought to be fairly easy because the forces are balanced, but I'm gonna go through it in a lot more detail. We can start with Newton's second law in the y direction, the acceleration in the y direction again, is the sum of the forces in the y direction over the mass and the sum of the forces again up minus down because we've chosen up to be the positive direction is the force that the floor exerts on the box minus the force that the earth exerts on the box all divided by the mass the sum of the forces is that difference and it's a difference because we're doing up minus down and it's up minus down because ups are positive direction all right this acceleration though in stage two is zero. And so we're left with zero is equal to all of this on the right side. The force that the floor exerts on the box minus the force that the earth exerts on the box, all divided by the mass. If we multiply each side by m, we're just left with zero equals the force times the floor exerts on the box minus the force that the earth exerts on the box and then we can add this term over to the other side of the equation and we're left with the force that the floor exerts on the box being equal to the force that the earth exerts on the box. Which is what we said it should be, right? You said these two forces should be equal because we're moving at a constant velocity. But I wanted to go through and show that you could also end up at that point if you just apply Newton's second law with an acceleration of zero. And because we know that this is 30 newtons, we know that in stage two, the force that the floor exerts on the box is that same 30 newton force. Stage three. Well, we can do actually the exact same math that we did for stage one. All of this still holds until we plug in numbers. And so, same as stage one, we get that the force that the floor exerts on the box is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction plus the um, force that the earth exerts on the box. Go check that this is the same as what we got in stage one. The difference now is as we slow down, our velocity change is downward. So it's a negative velocity change and therefore a negative acceleration. So what we've got is that the force that the floor exerts on the box is equal to mass times a negative two meter per second each second acceleration because we're accelerating downwards. This was three kilograms. Let me squeeze that in there, 3 kg plus 30 
newtons. So the force that the floor exerts on the box is equal to 30 plus negative 6 is positive 24 newtons. Positive is important because the floor is still pushing up on the box, but we end up with a number that is different than, or is less than the force that the earth exerts on the box, which is what we said. You'd feel lighter as the elevator slows to a stop. I said I wanted to do the kinematics graphs, and I do want to do that. So we'll end the video by drawing the kinematics graphs for this elevator. Um, go back and rewind if you're not feeling good about any of those computations, but if you are, let's keep moving forward. We're going to sketch out position, velocity, acceleration, time graphs. Always put which units you'd use to measure, which will be SI units, even if we're not going to use numbers, which we are not. All right. And I'm just going to divide this up into stage one, two, and three. All right. We'll start with the velocity graph, the one that has all of the information you could ever want. We start from rest. And we get faster at a constant rate during stage one. This is stage one, two, and three. During stage two, we are moving at a constant velocity. And so this velocity is unchanging. And then from two to three, we're slowing back down to a speed of zero meters per second. And so it'll look something like this. We get this uh, plateau shape. How does this translate to an acceleration time graph? Well, Acceleration is the slope of the velocity time graph. In stage one, we have a positive slope, which will correspond to that positive two meter per second squared acceleration. Zone two, the slope is zero, and so the acceleration is down here on the horizontal axis at zero. And then in stage three, the slope is negative, meaning in this case that we're getting slower. And so the acceleration is down there. The slopes are constant. They aren't, this graph isn't curving at all which means we get horizontal lines here. To end it, uh, here we're getting faster, and let's say we start at a position of zero. Uh, getting faster in a, a position time graph looks like an up opening parabola. In stage two, we're moving with a constant speed, so this will now be a line. And then in stage three, we're getting slower, which is a side opening parabola. So. The end result looks something like this. Op up opening parabola, line, side opening parabola for our three stages. All right, and that concludes everything you could ever want to know about elevators and then some. Next time you're in an elevator, pay attention to that feeling of lightness and heaviness. As always, feel free to shoot me an email or uh, let me know if you have any questions. I will end this video as soon as I find my, my mouse cursor. There we go.